I'll, I'll turn it you know, over to you and Jordan uh, uh, to run the tech. We have uh, a, good, a good number of folks uh, who have joined us this afternoon, 21 Terrific. attendees. Terrific. Uh, and uh, um, it's all yours. Great, great. Well, I want to uh, uh, extend my thanks to everybody this afternoon and, um, and, and especially to, um, to the attendees um, uh, to get some questions or not, sorry, to get some, get some comments. Uh, out today, and uh, thanks for bearing with me. I'll try to be really quick going through. Um, um, uh, actually, we'll do a we'll do a quick since this is sort of a meeting, even though it's not a uh, a meeting of a quorum of the commission. We'll uh, we'll start with a roll call anyway, and I'll uh, I'll start it off. Dave Luno here in Hopkinton. I see Bill Ardinger. Yes, thank you, Bill Ardinger in Concord at home. Um, no one else in the room. Terrific, and Mary Heath. Mary Heath here in Manchester, and my grandchildren might be in and out. They're swimming in the backyard. Sounds good. And Susan Heward? Susan Heward and Hook set no cat today. <laughs> All right. And Dick Ames? You're muted, oh, Dick. You're muted. Hi again. Uh, Dick Ames. I'm here in Jaffrey alone in my home. All righty. Thanks. And Val Zanchuk? Val Zanchuk's alone in his office in Jaffrey as well. Great, and we've got uh, Kareem Cascaden. I'm here, um, pulled over in the car on my way to Enfield uh, for another dose of child care. <laughs> All right, um, and uh, and let's see, Gen 4 uh, is with us. Hi, Gen 4 calling in from Concord. I'm home alone. All righty, and from the Carsey School, we've got uh, Carrie Portree. Carrie Portree, Dover, I'm here by myself. And Jordan Hensley. Jordan Hensley. I'm also in Dover. My fiance is in the other room. And Bruce Mallory. Uh, here calling in from Kerry Point, Maine, uh, in my office alone at home. Okay, great. Um, I don't think I missed anybody. So um, um, let's see. So just a, just a couple of uh, remarks to get us going here. Um, uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Yeah, we've, um, this is a second of our sort of longer formatted um, uh, public comment periods. We do have, um, uh, we do normally take about 15 or so minutes of public comment following commission meetings. But I think these extended uh, opportunities provide us for a little more opportunity from here from, uh, to hear from stakeholders around uh, the Granite State. And, um, um, uh, but, uh, but a, a couple of things. I mean, just because it's an extended format, it's not the opportunity to, uh, to take to present to the commission um, uh, because, um, I mean, for extensive presentations to the commission, because as you can see, there's not even a quorum of the, uh, of the commission members uh, in place here. But if you do actually have something that you'd like to present to the commission in a longer format, this would be a good place, good time to sort of lay it out, take two or three minutes, and um, and then um, uh, the um, uh, commission members can uh, can sort of take it under advisement to see if it makes sense to bring forward to either a, a commission session or a, a work group session. So um, let's see. The commission does have a substantial public engagement process in place through the um, through the Carsey School of Public Policy at UNH, and um, and so you can follow what's going on and participate in uh, in these by tuning into the live or recorded um, meetings which are available through the commission website. And you can also leave comment and ask questions through the commission website too, or by sending the commission uh, email. So the commission's website is carsey.unh.edu slash school dash funding. And to email the commission, uh, send your email to school funding, all one word, dot commission at unh.edu. Um, again, this is um, for public comment. It's not, uh, it's not for question, question and answer. Reason it's comment is because what's important to you is important for us to hear. So let us know what you're thinking. And, um, and I guess finally, um, is we operate, uh, the commission operates under a set of group agreements that keeps our work civil and productive and we don't any expect anything less or different during, uh, during public comment. So uh, uh, feel free to challenge ideas, raise contentious issues, but please don't make anything uh, personal. Uh, not gonna be um, using an egg timer or anything like that, 
but um, but if it's pretty clear that uh, that people get uh, get the gist of what you're what uh, what the point is, uh, we'll ask you to sort of you know wrap things up so that we can um, um, uh, continue on. Uh, Jordan Hensley is managing the meeting, so um, so uh, as we see hands raised, uh, Jordan will uh, move you in uh, in the order that it you know shows on the Zoom screen, and um, and we'll uh, we'll get things going. So anybody that does want to comment. Um, and you're uh, you're zoomed in. Uh, you just uh, raise your hand, and I think you do that through the panelist board, and um, uh, or if you're calling in, it's a star nine. So uh, if I got all that correct, Jordan, I'm going to hand it over to you. That is correct, and uh, we already have a couple folks with their hands raised, so uh, we can start uh, getting those comments in. And if if folks want to get in the queue, feel free to raise your hand. Our our first commenter today. Uh, will be Barry Brensinger. And Barry, I'm gonna bring you in here. All right, Barry, welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah, great, welcome. Uh, welcome to the commission, Barry. Thank you very much. I um, greatly appreciate your time. Thank you, commissioners. It's good to see some friendly faces, um, in particular my friends, Mary and Susan, both of whom have been uh, great supporters of Manchester Proud. Much appreciated. Um, undoubtedly, there are lots of pressing issues, as we all know, in our communities and state, but we at Manchester Proud think there are none more with more profound or lasting consequences than the um, urgent need to adequately fund our public schools. I've sent some of this along to you in writing. Um, for those of you who don't know Manchester Proud, we're this Manchester's first community-wide movement to build lasting understanding, engagement, and support for our public schools. Our work is authentically community-driven. Since 2017, we've held more than 400 meetings, interviews, listening sessions, planning forums throughout the city, and more than 10,000 of our residents have participated in our process in one form or another, which is pretty remarkable. Um, on February 20th, and this fortuitously happened literally a week or two before the pandemic took hold in, in our state of New Hampshire, uh, we presented a plan for the future of our schools to the district. It was unanimously, it was overwhelmingly adopted by the school board to a standing ovation by, uh, by a packed house at Memorial High School's auditorium. We encourage you to visit manchesterproud.org, check out the plan. It has more than 60 initiatives grouped into growing learners, educators, and growing our system. To the point, we have been and are acutely aware of New Hampshire's history of insufficient, inadequate, inequitable school funding. And as our work has progressed, and there have been an investment of thousands and thousands of volunteer hours in this initiative, it became increasingly clear to us that in spite of best intentions, um, driven by hopes and dreams, caring about every single child in our community, our plan will never achieve its ultimate potential, its ultimate success, in spite of great progress that's being made um, without reliable sources of adequate funding. Manchester is our state's most urban community, as we all know, and arguably our learners are most impacted by the challenges of the 21st century, are most impacted by the, the, the difficulties that we all face today as a result of um, remote learning and issues in schools um, that you are more than well aware of. So we as a community have come together with a resolve to provide the sp supports and learning opportunities our kids need, but we can't su succeed without state fulfilling its obligation to deliver needed funding. We ask you as a commission to be bold and brave. Um, I know you will be, I know most of you. Um, and to find an enduring resolution to this vital issue facing all of New Hampshire's communities. And I'll end as I did in my note to you with um, two points. I, I could have gone on with all kinds of data as I'm sure you're gonna, you, you have that information, you're gonna get that testimony. So I'm gonna make more of a, a tug on the heartstring kind of appeal. 
it is crystal clear to us in Manchester, Manchester Proud, that our public schools are an essential community asset that impacts the lives of everyone in our community. They are vital to our future. And in fact, our fate is directly linked to their greatness, to their success. And I'd ask you to consider one fundamental truth that I think often gets lost, um, um, gets lost among other distractions in conversations as it relates to our public schools. If you stop and think about it, more than any other institution or organization, it is our public schools that embody who we are as a people. Think about that for a moment. Who we are as a people with all of our strengths, our weaknesses, our commonalities, and our differences. And it is because our public schools embody us that they are the obvious and most opportune place to face, invest in, and improve ourselves. So as we contemplate all of the challenges in our world, our public schools lie at the root of the solution to so many of them. And yet somehow year after year, we fail to support them adequately. Our schools are the place to build a future with opportunities for everyone in New Hampshire to be their best selves. Thank you again for all that you do. Um, and Manchester Proud is eager and ready to be supportive of a, of a good resolution to this difficult challenge. Thank you. Great, thanks, thanks, Barry. Hang with us for a for a second. Would you would you take any questions? Of course. Um, do any of the commission members have uh, have any questions they'd like to um, ask, um, uh, Mr. Brenziger? Uh, go, go ahead, uh, Mary. You're muted. You're muted, Mary. You're muted, Mary. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> um, Barry, so wonderful to hear from you. Uh, Barry, would you talk a little bit about um, some of the specific um, inequities Good. that that your committee has seen and, and as a result of some of the efforts you're trying to do um, in Manchester? Um, uh, certainly, Mary. Um, and many of them um, are probably to some degree self-evident in the current world. I mean, we've got kids now learning remotely, and yet there's a substantial number of kids in our district that don't have adequate access to technology. Um, you know, you can, you can debate the numbers, but um, the numbers I've heard are somewhere around a quarter of them don't have reliable access. Somewhere around 10% of them have virtually no access. Um, and so that is obviously a great impediment to them. Um, and then it goes beyond that. Um, just there's there's a lot of systemic. I'm I'm looking at um, my friend Bruce, whose um, seminar I sat through um, for a number of uh, through the L2E2 program, which was very well done. There's a lot of systemic inequity built into the system um, for our kids who are most challenged, who who uh, are in greatest need of our support. Um, and uh, Manchester Proud is um, doing some work to um, help remedy that, we hope. Um, today, we launched a new um, program to create a robust 22 school citywide school to community partnership network. Um, we got a grant to fund that work and we are going to develop a model for how communities create a network to fully invest in as a community, applying our resources through our businesses and organizations to create partnerships with our schools. We are working um, on a forum with um, uh, potential supporters to help address the digital inequity issue. Um, of course, the dollars that we can provide are relatively small compared to what are needed to, to do that um, um, effectively. And, I think the point of all of this is this shouldn't be crisis driven and episodic. It shouldn't be that a Manchester Proud has to go out and raise $500,000 to solve a problem in our district. If we were prioritizing our public schools appropriately and funding them 
certainly rationally this is this is still new hampshire and we're you know we're frugal with our dollars this isn't about that this is about being making a smart investment in the future of our kids and communities um we certainly hope we will soon get to the point where we can all look back and say we've accomplished that um uh anybody else have any any questions for um for barry while we've got him on the line um, I have one, um, uh, in fact, Mary got, uh, got one half of it, um, uh, the question I was going to ask, and, and thanks for asking that, Mary. The, um, the other half of that question, and you just sort of um, uh, led into it a little bit, Barry, is the inadequate um, side and the, and the funding side. And, um, and I guess, do you have any thoughts as to um, what, would, uh, what would be something that's um, um, more adequate? Oh, I, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't, I'm not a, a prepared to recommend a specific dollar amount. Okay. I mean, I, it's actually, a Manchester Proud's chairperson, Liz Kerwin, I think also has her hand up. And she's going to speak a bit to that issue about, you know, if you did some calculations where Manchester lands relative to other communities. So I'll defer to her um, to share the data that's been prepared for that. No, that's 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 fine. Um, we'll uh, we'll look to hear from Liz for that. But uh, as as you know, we're, the the commission is entering into its um, its uh, deliberation phase. We do have um, we're starting to get um, uh, early uh, you know data back from our um, research consultants mm -hmm. uh, on uh, on costing. So uh, we're certainly very interested in in hearing. Um, uh, people's thoughts on that. So, uh, anything else for uh, for Mr. Brensinger while we've got him here? Um, great, Barry. Thanks very much. Thank you and very much. Appreciate it, Jordan. All right. Our next hand up is John M. Lewis. John, welcome. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Welcome. Welcome to the commission, John. Well, thank you. Uh, as, a, as a little background about me, I, I, I've been involved with education matters for quite a long time. I was on uh, the Oyster River Local School Board in the early to mid-1990s with Iris Estabrook, who I'm sorry is not uh, here today. Uh, I was chairman of our State Board of Education from 1997 to 2001. And as part of that, I was on the task force to deal with the definition of adequacy and costing that Governor Shaheen put together associated with her ABC program and which was chaired by John Crozier of the, of the Business and Industry Association back in that time. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sanchuk, a, a really great uh, predecessor of yours. Um, I also wrote a law review article with a, a, a former partner of mine, Steve Borofsky, entitled Claremont 1 and 2, Where Were They Rightly Decided and Where Are We Now? And it was over 100 pages long, and it, it was pretty comprehensive, if I don't say so myself, and, in, and also had an aspect of it which dealt with, well, where are we in New Hampshire? And I will say to you, I'm pleased to see that you, your commission and I are pretty much in sync. Uh, the major challenge in my mind is a class one. It has to do with the fact that we have a fairly uh, affluent, wealthy group of people, and we also have some very vulnerable people. Uh, and uh, it's reflected in how our schools perform based on all the uh, methods of evaluation that you have been using uh, and uh, merely because and it, it's all getting a little complicated now by the fact that increasingly in some areas like Manchester and Nashua you're, you're finding uh, an increase of minority representation uh, a great number of uh, single-family households uh, so when you're using that free and reduced lunch as a factor, that's a very good factor. It really is a strong indicator of, of, of need. So um, I, was, I, 
my, my law review article was in the 2016 UNH law review. Um, and it's, uh, it also deals with the fact that other states are, are struggling with this problem. Massachusetts uh, is, is, uh, is our closest state. And in fact, in many ways, we've been associated with the same struggles over the same time frame. But it's very interesting to watch what goes on in Washington State and Kansas, New Jersey, New York. Uh, the, the interplay between the courts, the legislature, uh, the understanding of the limitations of the courts, uh, but also their responsibilities. And uh, you're, you're operating under a situation where there is a court case going on. Uh, Judge Ruoff wrote a decision which declared unconstitutional the very mechanism you're looking at. Um, it's interesting to me that the defense of the, that the state is putting up on that is quite procedural and technical and doesn't deal with what you need to deal with, which is not the law and the legal mumbo jumbo as much as the fact that $3,500 is just totally out of bounds with what the reality is in terms of what, it's, what is needed to fund adequately uh, a child's education in New Hampshire. I, I think the Supreme Court's gonna be very interested in what you do and how you come out with things. And uh, I, so I urge you to, to understand that the best situations across the country have been when the legislature and the courts have worked in sync, not against one another. <laughs> and good models such as uh, do exist. Uh, and so I, I urge you to, to keep that in mind. I, I, I listened very attentively to Monday's presentation about costing. I saw much to like about it. Uh, the numbers were realistic, much, much more realistic than what I've uh, seen in the past. Uh, to talk about twelve or thirteen thousand dollars per student as a sort of a minimum uh, amount, uh, then qualified and changed by differential aid circumstances, uh, is much more realistic than than three thousand five hundred with a differential aid that was created. Uh, by the legislature. Uh, it's also very interesting that the well-founded idea that money does make a difference when well spent uh, is, at a found, is at the foundation of some of the studies here. I will throw one caution to you, which is that this, whatever formula you come up with, if it's going to be based on this, needs to be very closely reviewed and analyzed by you and criticized before you really throw it out to the public because there's gonna be a lot of demagoguery about all of this, a lot of emphasis of anything that is unclear. So challenge uh, the experts to explain themselves in the clearest possible way uh, I do think, for example, when, when uh, I was the one who sort of asked the question about the $5,000, uh, uh, to simply say that it's an extrapolation of something or other isn't enough. You need to be extremely clear about just step by step how you came up with these numbers in order for them, for, in order for it to have the credibility because it's going to be a shock. You, you all know that I, you're going to be dealing with numbers of that are going to be considered state responsibility for education, which are astronomically higher than whatever has ever been done before in New Hampshire. Uh, it's going to challenge this state, the well-off people in this state, to ask themselves, are they ready now to start dealing with the education of the more vulnerable people. In the past, they have not been. <laughs> there are easy ways of starting talking about donor, donee, and all of this uh, that resulted in uh, things getting uh, stopped. And so your challenge in my mind is to be as clear and transparent as you possibly can be 
I really am, admire the, stru the structure you've put together. I admire how uh, uh, well you're moving along and taking on the issues. When you get to funding, my suggestion to you is take it on with a number of different options. Present to the public different ways of reaching the, the goal of making sure each child has an adequate education. Tax schemes, every one of them are, have flaws. Every one of them can be challenged and attacked. If you're gonna go with a property tax, it's attackable, but it's also something you can turn into a more progressive tax if you wanted to. Uh, the broad-based taxes uh, have a big ideological aspect to them in this state, hard to get people to even deal with them. On the other hand, if you present a good, good understandable reason for them, for the, for, for the raising of money and the use of them, maybe people will buy into it in this day and age, maybe. Uh, I'm not optimistic or pessimistic. I think it's, it's a problem. This state has a philosophy of local control and limited spending. When you ask people to take, to look at education as a major priority beyond a lot of other things, uh, some people can understand that and some people can't. Your job is to make them understand that educate, good education for all children has, uh, resonates beyond uh, just education itself. It relates to law enforcement, it relates to health, it relates to a lot of things. And if you, if you, if you come up with a message like that, uh, boy, it will be uh, really helpful. I think, you know, don't ignore the, the, the option of perhaps uh, looking to some form of a constitutional amendment and some form of uh, 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 targeting the aid that you can get out of the state. Present it at least as an option. Let people think about it. Uh, you don't, I'm not uh, saying it's a good idea or a bad idea. Certainly a lot will depend uh, on just uh, what the political debate would be and what the wording of any kind of constitutional amendment would be. But one thing I know that would be bad is that, every, is that you don't meet the challenge of coming up realistically with the money uh, that is really necessary. What happened in 2008, a lot of good intentioned people, a lot of people worked really hard and the politics of the situation ended up so that a Judge Ruoff would basically say, hey, this looks like something that was polit politically convenient and not really reflective of what the needs of children are uh, in terms of uh, adequate education. Uh, that is certainly, my sense of it is the Supreme Court judges we have today uh, need to, uh, you need to pass the sleep at night test if you're a judge. I can talk about that. I was a Superior Court judge for 13 years. Um, so, John, we're not going to be able to get into that part of the story. Yes, I know. Right that. Now, so, um, okay. but, what, uh, what do you mean by that? You're not going to be dealing with uh, the, the court case at all in your... No, no, no. Just your history as a, as a Superior Court judge. Oh, no, I, I, I know. I'm, not, I'm just saying to you as a judge in general, uh, judges, it's a tough job. And right. you're going to find that the Supreme Court is probably going to be very interested in working very constructively with you. That's my point. Great, great. So, well, John, uh, thanks, thanks very much for um, for your your um, your comments and I think really insightful um, uh, words this afternoon. I, I, I I'm sure that's going to be very helpful. I know it's going to be very helpful to the to the commission. And um, and I should also mention that we're going to be stepping up the frequency of these extended meetings starting next month. There'll be uh, there'll be uh, two in October. Uh, I'm sorry, two in September, two in October, um, and uh, and we'll see where it goes from there. But um, uh, but we're going to be looking to have a, a, a commission report out uh, right at the beginning of December. So, um, um, it, so it would be very good if some of the people who are not uh, haven't bought into the need for more funding of education actually came and commented publicly about their feelings to you because that's what would make your commission even more constructive. 
Don't right. leave it to the last minute and play a political game with this. Try to deal with it now. Right, right. No, and and um, uh, a few weeks ago we did actually get we have substantial comments from uh, from from people that feel um, uh, differently than you do um, and, and differently than um, than Mr. Brunzinger about this. So yes, we are uh, we do want to hear from them. Great. Um, any questions for um, uh, for um, Mr. Lewis? John, thanks again very much. Thank you. And I and I hope we uh, uh, you you continue to be engaged in this, and I hope we hear from you some more. I, I plan to try to. Fantastic. Thank you, Th thank you. Uh, Jordan. All right. Our next commenter will be Jill Hammond. Jill, welcome. Can you hear me now? Hi, Jill. Welcome to the commission. Um, before we get started, I just want to say that I uh, we've got uh, we've got a number of hands up. And um, you know we've budgeted about another you know half hour or so uh, for comments. So we want to let's we want to give everybody a, a little bit of a fair um, uh, field to work with on this. So um, uh, uh, so Jill, um, yeah, welcome. Okay, thank you, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'm a former state rep, and I have prepared my statement uh, in a written form. Uh, Dick Ames, my state rep. Currently, he already has a copy of it. I will be sending it to you because I included a graph in it as well that you can't see. And um, I am I'm prepared because of having been a state rep, I know that I gotta be succinct and put this out quickly. Okay, um, here we go. In 2006, the town of Hollis re released a report, the cost of growth, an examination of the effect of recent population growth on its property taxes and costs to the town. While I was serving as a state representative for Peterborough between 2007 and 2010, I was told about this survey by State Senator James Squires, then serving the district of which Hollis was a part. He was also the chair of the town committee that conducted the survey. The committee had surveyed residents of the town uh, with more than half of the households responding to the key question, what portion of your household income goes to paying property taxes? The whole report is still posted on Hallis Town website. In my printed form, I have the links. A short chart on page seven shows the results. The largest group, 465 households, paid between five and 10% of household income and property taxes. The median was at about 8%. Below that bracket, 185 households paid between 1 and 4.9%. Above, 270 households paid between 10 and 15%. In total, though, 490 households paid more than 10% of income and property taxes. But the extremes are the most telling. 25 households paid less than 1%, while 28 paid in excess of 35% of their household income and in property taxes. Other key findings in the survey were that the longer residents had lived in their homes and the older they were, the higher their portion of income went to paying property taxes. I built a graph showing these statistics as a bar chart It'll be page two of the PDF I'll send you. I believe uh, it's- no, go, go ahead, Jill, I'm sorry. It's a standard sort of bell curve. I believe that if, if surveyed, the profile of the burden of property taxes on residents in any given town in New Hampshire would mirror the results in Hollis. That profile might shift somewhat depending on whether we're talking about a rich town or a poor town, but it would essentially repeat across the state. When we were trying to figure out a way to do targeted aid back in 2007 and eight, I was there, I voted on that. Hollis was always considered a rich town and would not have gotten aid. But clearly there were Hollis residents who were grossly overtaxed. You can decide to have a big government or a small government, but if the taxing structure that supports that government is unfair, taxing some citizens at excessive rates, then you have bad government. 
in the decade or more since that survey was taken, the property tax portion of state and local revenues collected in New Hampshire has risen from about three fifths to nearly two thirds due to the cutting at the state level and downshifting of costs to towns and school districts. Over-reliance on local property tax hardly seems like a fair way to tax, especially for something as crucial as education. And I'd like to um, make one more comment here that if you're talking about targeting something, target tax relief, don't target the aid. The, what is needed for education for any given student should be what it is across the whole state. And, and you fund what is needed to educate those children. When it comes to, to targeting stuff, target the tax relief to people who are, who are overtaxed to pay for education. And one last thing. Some people might say that an adequate diet is bread and water but certainly that it's not nourishing. And I think we should change our definition of what we will fund in education from mere adequacy to good, nourishing, nurturing education. I think that's enough for one day. Jill, thank, Jill, thank you very much. And, um, and you said that, um, that uh, Rep Ames has, um, uh, has your, um, your written comments with the graph so he can share that with the commission. He does have it. I will also send it directly to the uh, commission. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay. And and, uh, and um, uh, Bruce, we can make sure that gets um, gets out to all the members, al yes. along with obviously the notes from today. So, and terrific. I would I would also suggest um, if he's still available, talk to Senator Squires about that that report and how it was set up. Great, great. Jill, thanks so much for uh, for joining us this afternoon. Glad to help. All right, Jordan. All right, our next hand up is Michael Harrington. Michael, welcome. Uh, hello, good afternoon. I'm hoping you guys can hear me. Hello, Michael. Yeah, welcome to the commission. Thank you for having me. Uh, I just want to do a, just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Michael Harrington. I am the uh, current vice chair um, and former uh, school board chair for Fall Mountain. Um, I uh, am a former New Hampshire educator. I am currently a uh, Vermont um, uh, school administrator. Um, I hold a master's degree in special education and a doctorate in education, um, educational leadership. And the only reason I bring this up is just to let you know that I enough background in history here about education in New Hampshire, um, hopefully to um, be something worthwhile. And um, where I am of the mind that there is a severe inequity in New Hampshire um, that needs to be addressed, I'm going to honestly go out on a limb and say that I believe you guys know that. Um, you probably have more numbers and facts and talk to people than I have. Um, but what I really want to talk to you about is the strain that the current funding method puts on local government. Um, this last year, um, my uh, town of residence, Charlestown, uh, tried to um, leave Fall Mountain, um, which would have uh, decimated uh, education in five towns. Um, it would have hurt Charlestown drastically. Um, there has been a breakdown in communication between uh, the school board and the towns. And as far as I can talk back, uh, I figure it, it goes back decades. Um, I stood at a uh, select board in Charlestown and they started telling me all the problems with the school board and they got back to something that someone said in Walpole back in 1983. Um, I had to tell them uh, respectfully that that was before my wife was born um, and we really can't get beyond it. Um, Walpole, which is in our district, is, in, is, a, is a wealthy town. Uh, Charlestown is not. Uh, we sit on um, 91, um, which is a corridor for homelessness um, and people um, jumping uh, um, over the border, um, up and down this quarter of 91, looking for cheap housing, which um, Charlestown has an abundance of. Um, 
the problem is the tax rate in Charlestown for this year is sitting out about forty dollars a thousand. Um, and when the town just started discussing leaving, and you had some people there that were f really for it, and you had some people that were really against it, coming out with facts and numbers, because an economy of scale does not lie, and trying to go on your own cannot possibly be better for the town or for the students that are trying to be educated. But what happened is the people in the town are so economically hurt and have been for so long. And there is such a disconnect and anger between a school board and a select board and then the separate towns that no one trusts anyone anymore. So when you say something and you bring out the numbers, they they don't believe you. There was uh, a statement saying that even though um, every number in the book said that if Charlestown left on, went on their own, that it would cost them an extra $8 million, Charlestown officials were saying, you're going to save millions. And people are so desperate that they believe them. They I went to meeting after meeting. I mean, this tiny little town uh, just packed this uh, uh, little meeting house multiple times. And it, it really does. If you go through it and you spend the time, which I know you have, it stems from funding. It stems from desperation. People want to save money in our towns. And we had, we, years ago, they floated an idea of a regional middle school. It would save $800,000 a year. But there's so much distrust and there's so much bad blood in history there. They, you can't even talk about it without getting yelled at. But they still want to say, I want to save money. I want to save money. Well, $800,000 a year. That's something. You, if you call the Department of Education, as I did when I was first elected to the Fall Mountain School Board, and you said, hey, I'd like to talk about the Fall Mountain funding formula. formula. I'm not even kidding you. You get a groan and a, ugh. Oh, that is one of, it is the most complicated funding formula in the entire state. Hands down, no questions. It took years for me to even kind of understand it. And the reason it's there is because they're within the confines of these five towns, they're trying to find something that's fair. Okay. Not even, I can't even approach equitable, but fair. And while there's an argument whether it's fair or not, I'm not even kidding you. Last year we sat down uh, about the high school saying, you know what, whether the heat's on, um, with just one kid or 200 kids, you all have to pay the same heating bill. So instead of running this by ADA, why don't we just run that, split it by five? So they're, they're talking about heating. They're talking about who's paying what, what for parking while we only have so many kids that drive. I mean, these are conversations of desperation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And something's got to change. And I applaud the work that you're doing. It is a... Um, it's going to be a hard road that you've already been on, um, but it needs to change. Yep. I have got young children um, in Fall Mountain, and uh, I want to make sure that they have a chance to be educated because education is the social ladder that moves you up. I grew up incredibly poor, and without a solid education, I would not be where I am today. And that's really it. Michael, uh, thank you very much for, um, for joining us this afternoon. Thanks uh, also for um, your, uh, your service to your communities uh, in Vermont and in New Hampshire as a school administrator and as a member of your local governing board. Um, uh, you know, 12 years on the Hopkins and School Board, um, uh, it's uh, some of the most fulfilling work uh, you can do. So, so thanks for that and, uh, and certainly um, uh, appreciate the the challenges you've got in in charlestown um sorry about the background noise but we're um um uh, you know you, you may be familiar with with what we're going through in hopkinton right now as well so um uh, 
But uh, anyway, thanks very much, Michael. Um, anybody have any questions for um, um, uh, for uh, Mr. Harrington? Thanks very much again for joining us. Thank you. And I hope you uh, you stay in touch with uh, with the progress and uh, and and um, and let us know. Keep letting us know what what you're thinking. Jordan. All right, our next speaker will be Chris Raymond of Allenstown. Chris, welcome. Great, thank you so much for having me. Hi Chris, welcome to the commission. Thank you very much. So my name is Chris Raymond. I'm both a parent in Allenstown and I'm also the Allenstown School Board Chair. So I thank you all for continuing to work tirelessly on this committee in light of the COVID challenges that I think have made things difficult but I am really looking forward to what the future holds for education funding. So you all know the tax poor towns of Allenstown is one of them. We are in the top 20 highest tax rates in the state. So today I just wanna shed light on the discussion that I believe adequate funding needs to consider adequate infrastructure too. So in Allenstown, we've got two school buildings that are over 60 years old. They have been woefully under maintained or renovated for having any sort of building fixes, building updates, because our residents have no appetite for paying increased taxes for schools. So we do the budget on the curriculum only. Therefore, we have not been able to budget for any building updates nor do we have any surplus to add to our trust funds to fix a building in the very near future. So we do use surplus to direct it into the trust funds that we've set up for building repair and renovation. However, we are only able to add on average about 20,000 per year. And at that rate, we're never gonna fix a building with saving only 20,000 per year. So we are currently at a point in Allenstown where we have to do something with our buildings because our middle school can no longer be held together with duct tape and super glue. It has been woefully, woefully under maintained. So we actually have put in a Department of Education application for a full K-8 to building renovation over at our elementary school, which only holds K through four today. So this DOE application for a renovation would get us to one building, much more efficient. However, the cost estimates for this renovation to get all of our students into that one building involves the Allenstown taxpayer agreeing to fund $10 million for this renovation. And that's only if we get approved by the DOE and get the 60% state building funding that we qualify for. So we are putting this renovation on our March 2021 ballot to have the town vote. I'm hopeful with positive changes to education funding, I can make the plea to the Allenstown residents that we can afford this $10 million portion of our school renovation in the very near future. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you taking my comment. Thank you very much, Ms. Raymond. And, um, and, and uh, you know, thank you. For uh, for your leadership on the uh, the Allenstown board, um, uh, and um, uh, and and please um, please stay in touch with us, particularly on the, the building aid uh, component of um, of this. And uh, we've had um, I might also refer you to um, uh, Jordan. Do you remember offhand which um, uh, which date was it? July sixteenth, maybe there was a uh, discussion on building aid in the adequacy work group that's correct it was it was july uh 16th if you go to our website you can find uh, a lot of information and also the recording of that meeting right right and and so in particularly the um the the doe um uh director of uh, facilities um amy clark uh presented and so um so if you haven't if you haven't um checked that out chris i definitely um uh, uh say tune into that will do thank you so much great thanks so much um, let's see, uh, where are we at, uh, Jordan? So we have uh, two more folks with their hands raised right now. And okay. the next person on our list is Dennis Goddard. Dennis, welcome. Hi, folks. I'll, I'll try and be as quick as I can here. Great. I, welcome, I, Dennis. Thank you. I, I want to ask a pretty naive question. And, and again, I apologize for its naivete. Um, I understand that the vast supermajority of folks, both on this call and, and in our state, do believe very sincerely that 
um, education is best uh, funded or best managed through a monopoly run by the state. Um, and that's, that's fine, but I'm kind of asking as a member of a minority group, uh, basically the group of people who feel that in general, funding for things is best done on a voluntary basis by willing participants and without coercion or threat. Um, because those situations do allow for market forces, rapid changes to extenuating circumstances, changes to technology that are much more difficult to do in a monopoly situation. And I'm, I'd, I'd like to ask, what are your recommendations for people who are in a minority like mine who, who don't feel that um, a single organization running education for the, for the vast majority of children is in fact a, a good organization for our society. Thank you. So thanks very much for your, um, I, I know you asked it as a question, but we're gonna take it as a comment. And I think we get the gist of your, uh, your comment. I, I, I rather did ask a question and it would be- Yeah, nice and, I, and, what, and what, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting, Dennis, is that you turn it into a comment and, and say that, uh, that um, well, say what, however you believe that to be, to be a comment. I, I'm asking for your suggestions as to how folks in this minority group who feel as I do should proceed forward. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my answer to that would be to um, to uh, bring those comments um, uh, forward and uh, and email the commission uh, with those comments. So thanks very much, Mr. Goddard. Dennis, I'm not Dennis. Jordan, where are we? All right, we've got one more hand raised. Uh, looks like Liz Kerwin. Great. And let's see. Okay. And Liz, welcome. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Hi Liz, welcome to the commission. Hi, yes. thank you so much for taking my comment. Um, my, my name is Liz Kerwin, I live in Manchester, New Hampshire. <clears throat> I'm an English language learner teacher at Manchester High School West. I'm a parent in the district and I'm also the current chair of Manchester Proud's Champion Council. And I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to, um, to speak with you today. So uh, to start, I think it's important to define what equal versus equity looks like when we're talking about this current funding status. And we know that right now the current funding status from the state to individual districts is allocating the same amount of money per pupil across the state. And this is an equality action. This is an equal action. But we know that to make it equitable, that this means that allocations need to be adjusted depending on need and population of the districts. So I really appreciate the work that this commission faces and the time and investment from every member to work collaboratively when you're finding a, an appropriate solution for funding our schools. We also know that Manchester is the third lowest funded school district in the state, just ahead of Landaff and Auburn. But what makes Manchester unique is that we have close to 14,000 students and that Manchester is the largest district in the state. This means that Manchester has more students in their public schools than the entire population of 213 other towns in New Hampshire, and that's out of only 234. So in the context of our state, 14,000 students makes up a significant total in the overall state system. But we can look at this even further in a different way. According to the New Hampshire DOE or the Department of Education, the 2016 school year fifth grade classroom average in Manchester was 25 students per class, while statewide the average was 20. If we consider the current average of district funding right now, that's more to, that's close to $16,000, Manchester is at an approximate $4,000 deficit per student in those classes. This from the state average. This means that each classroom has a deficit of $100,000 compared to other districts. And we know that this affects not just our students, but we have to consider how this deficit affects their access to resources, the quality of our school buildings themselves, infrastructure. But also, how does this affect attracting and maintaining highly qualified educators in our district? This is not equitable. If we take a larger, more macro view into this deficit, this $4,000 deficit per student in a district of our 14,000 kids in Manchester 
equates to a total of over $55 million every year to Manchester. This is our $55 million deficit. And this is not a one-time problem. This is an annual issue of inequity. If we take a moment to think about it, it really amplifies the case for an equitable long-term funding solution. And I hope this commission will take into account the size, the needs, municipal tax wealth, and already existing funding deficits when considering the best solution to an equitable funding, to equitable funding for all of our districts. But what else makes Manchester unique is the fact that Manchester Proud has been established as a community response to the need to enhance and reinvest in our public schools. More than 10,000, as you heard Barry say in the beginning, more than 10,000 community members came together to hold sessions about our schools. The annual deficit of school funding may have stripped us of our appropriate resources in this district, but it has not stripped our spirit. Manchester Proud is invested in fostering and advocating for equity within our schools, across our city, and even here at the state level for our students. With adequate funding, our schools will thrive and Manchester students will all have the same opportunities as other more tax wealthy districts. Our schools are our students and our students are our future. How can we deny them the success that they deserve? Through Manchester Proud, and the Manchester School District, we are now implementing um, opportunities for success, but now we need the adequate and equitable funding from the state. We're invested and we hope the state will invest in Manchester too. Thank you for your time and for considering these comments as part of your process. Great, Liz, uh, thanks very much for, um, for joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, I do have a question for you, if you don't mind taking a, a quick question. And um, you'd mentioned that, uh, that Manchester is currently in, I think you used a $55 million deficit, um, given what should be spent. I, th I think that's what you meant. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Okay. Based and off so, of the state average. And uh, our all right. Yeah, and so our how, did you, how did you calculate that? So I took it, um, I subtracted the difference of the state average of around 16,000 from Manchester's total, which is around 13,000. And then I multiplied that by our total student population, which equates to about, or student population of around 14,000. And that equates to our $55 million deficit okay. compared to okay. the state average in total. Okay, so, um, so that, uh, that would then sort of imply that, that Manchester's, um, demographics challenges, everything is, is average in the state as opposed to unique. Um, and and um, you know, one of the things I think we've been learning too is that, is that every city and town has very unique um, uh, challenges. So it doesn't take Absolutely, into consideration. So the 55 million doesn't take into the consideration the uniqueness. That's true, yeah, it's just general numbers. Okay, okay, fine. That, I, Thank you for um, for shedding some light on that, and thanks for um, uh, for joining us. Uh, any other uh, commission members have questions for um, uh, for um, uh, Liz Kerwin? Well, she's sir. I I hope you will continue to join our um, uh, our meetings and uh, and and lend your input. So absolutely, yeah. I look forward to the new sessions in September. Terrific. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, let's see how are things looking, Jordan. Great, we've got uh, one more hand raised here. Let's see, uh, Carolyn Miebert. Carolyn. Hey, here I am. Right. What, welcome, Carolyn. Thanks. Uh, Good, thanks I've for spoke, joining us again. Yeah, I've spoke to you before, yep. and I've also given you some other material via email. Uh, and first of all, I want to say what Liz just said was fabulous. I mean, everything she said was spot on. And I would also add to that, that Dover is fourth from the bottom in per, per pupil expenditure or cost per pupil is the way it's listed. So um, we're in pretty bad shape as well. And I have also figured out that deficit that Dover is experiencing relative to the average. And our teachers and some of the members of our community have come out to city council and said, we just want to be average. We just want to be average, which is kind of a sad thing for people to be saying. We would all like to be from Lake Wobegon, I believe, above average. But anyway, um, I was listening to the meeting on Monday and I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that I think are important. 
what AIR was saying was that um, students who are doing more poorly are from districts that are spending less money. But in fact, in the state, students who are doing more poorly are from districts that are getting more adequacy aid, more state aid. They're just getting less overall because the cities or the municipalities or the districts, when they're combined, uh, are paying less out of their tax dollars toward education. And one of the things that I think is real important to keep in mind is that the average, again, in the state, is that 64% of tax dollars, property tax dollars, are going to education. And that's the combination of swept and local. 64%. Dover's at 53%. Manchester is at like 40 something percent. I can't remember the exact figure. And so there's quite a bit of variability in the amount of money that is coming from tax dollars or the percent of tax dollars that are going to education. And I think that's really, really important to keep in mind when you're thinking about costing um, an adequate education. So that's all. Okay, great. Well, Carolyn, thanks. Thanks very much. And um, uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your, uh, your, your input today. I, I think um, that those are very important things for us to, um, uh, to keep in, in front of our mind and, uh, and do, uh, I hope you'll, you'll continue to be engaged with the commission as you have been. And, uh, and I thank you very much for, um, um, uh, for all your, uh, your assistance along the way. So. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, any members have, have, uh, have a question for, uh, for Carolyn. Great. Carolyn, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. How are we looking, um, Jordan? Uh, no, no further hands raised and we are a little bit after five here. So I think we're right yeah. on track. Well, you know, I, I was a few minutes late. So, uh, so we're ending a few minutes late. So thank you very much for, uh, for your indulgence. Thanks to all of our attendees today for, I think, supplying the commission with, with some very thoughtful um, inputs. Um, uh, we'll get the, uh, we'll get the notes circulated among the, uh, to the commission along with um, the uh, prepared remarks that, um, uh, that were submitted. And uh, anything else for the good of the cause? Well, everybody, thanks for, uh, for, uh, for taking time out this um, summer afternoon. Enjoy the evening. Mary, I like, um, uh, I think we'll all, we'll all be going over to your house. Looks pretty nice. So, <laughs> all right, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, call it, uh, we'll call it done for today. And, um, and the uh, 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 work groups return uh, starting 10 o'clock on Monday. We'll see you all then. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Take care.